At 7 o'clock, I'm Dermot Murnahan. This is Sky News Tonight, live from Downing Street, where in a little over a week, a new Prime Minister will be moving into the building behind me. I cannot deliver the mandate on which I was elected by the Conservative Party. I have therefore spoken to His Majesty the King to notify him that I am resigning as leader of the Conservative Party. Liz Truss steps down, becoming the shortest serving Prime Minister in British history after just six weeks in office. It will be possible uh, to conduct a ballot and conclude a leadership election uh, by Friday the 28th of October. The chairman of the 1922 committee, Sir Graham Brady, fires the starting gun on the sprint to become her successor. Among the hopefuls, her predecessor, Boris Johnson, is also expected to stand. To sleaze, but Labour say it's time to give what the people say a say. Judgment? There should be a general election. We can't just allow the Tory party to keep putting up the next candidate in the middle of this chaos. A very good evening from Downing Street on yet another remarkable day. After just 44 days as Prime Minister, Liz Truss has resigned the shortest premiership in British history. A visit this morning by the chairman of the powerful 1922 committee was then followed by a 90-second resignation speech. The Prime Minister claimed that given the situation, she could not deliver on her mandate. And therefore, in just over a week's time, the building behind me will have a new residence. Coming up, we'll tell you the rules that have been announced to find that person, see who the hopefuls are, and look back on Liz Truss's rise and fall. But first, here's our political editor, Beth Rigby. It is over. The shortest serving Prime Minister stepping down. I came into office at a time of great economic and international instability. Families and businesses were worried about how to pay their bills. Putin's illegal war in Ukraine threatens the security of our whole continent. And our country has been held back for too long by low economic growth. I was elected by the Conservative Party with a mandate to change this. A mandate which slipped away after just six weeks. I recognise, though, given the situation, I cannot deliver the mandate on which I was elected by the Conservative Party. I have therefore spoken to His Majesty the King to notify him that I am resigning as leader of the Conservative Party. This morning I met the chairman of the 1922 committee, Sir Graham Brady. We've agreed that there will be a leadership election to be completed within the next week. I will remain as Prime Minister until a successor has been chosen. Thank you turning her back on an embattled premiership, only her husband by her side. This a very lonely way to leave. Sir Graham Brady, the man charged with the next steps. Here, please, Sir Graham. Here, please, Sir Graham. Setting out the direction of the party and country too. I have spoken to the party chairman, Jake Berry, and he has confirmed that it will be possible uh, to conduct a ballot and conclude a leadership election uh, by Friday the 28th of October. So we should have a new leader in place before the fiscal statement, which will take place on the 31st. A new leadership contest, the second in four months, conducted at breakneck speed. This time next week, we'll have a new PM. For the press and the public too, it's bewildering. How disappointed are you in this? The public must be looking at this thinking, what on earth is going on? This is the governing party. Absolutely, and I, I think we're deeply conscious uh, of the imperative in the national interest of resolving this uh, clearly and quickly. By early evening, the detail come into light. Conservative MPs have to decide fast. Uh, good afternoon again. Uh, just to confirm, I've met with the board of the Conservative Party and the executive of the 1922 Committee. The process for the parliamentary stages of the contest uh, will begin now. Nominations are now open. Uh, we'll close at 2 o'clock 
on Monday. Candidates will be expected to have at least 100 uh, uh, colleagues uh, nominating them. A decision to whittle the field back dramatically if only one MP hits the threshold will know the new PM by Monday. This will be quick, but for Labour it's not enough. It's demanding a general election. Seki, so, you're calling for a general election, uh, but at a moment of acute instability, there has been market instability, uh, there's a cost of living crisis. The Tories are going to replace the Prime Minister within a week. And the general election is going to take weeks and weeks and weeks. Can you see that that might not be practical right now? But the risk to the country is carrying on with this utter chaos. Um, so you've got this real choice, utter chaos with the Conservatives or stability under a Labour government. So the risk is not a general election. The risk is carrying on with this utter chaos. They've made... Huge, they've damaged the economy very badly in the last few weeks. This damage has been done. The Conservative Party's decided we need a new Prime Minister. Liz Truss has been forced to resign after just 44 days in office. This whole sorry affair has been a dark, dark chapter for the Tories. MPs are now trying to turn the corner. There will be a new Prime Minister next week. But the party is having, in the words of one minister, a collective breakdown. And after two lots of vicious bloodletting, first around Boris Johnson and now around Liz Truss, you have to ask yourself whether a new leader can stop the rot. The sun set in on a deeply unsettling day in Westminster. In these tumultuous times, a nation awaiting leadership. Beth Rigby, Sky News, Westminster. Well, of course, just last month, Liz Truss entered number 10 after a leadership campaign that lasted eight weeks. She was finally installed as leader and prime minister after about 81,000 Tory members voted for her. Now, this time round, that process is being distilled down to just one week. Uh, let's take a look at how that is proposed to work. So Sir Graham Brady, the chair of the 1922, announced that nominations for the race to be the next prime minister are now open. They will close at 2 p.m. on Monday. That's for MPs. Candidates will need at least 100 nominations from Conservative MPs to meet the threshold. If there is more than one candidate that meets those requirements, an online vote for Conservative Party members will then open. And all stages, they say, of the leadership election are intended to be concluded by next Friday, the 28th of October. Now, in terms of uh, who may stand, well, currently Rishi Sunak is the bookmaker's favourite to take over, of course, the defeated candidate last time round, followed by Penny Mordaunt. Then, uh, well, get this, Boris Johnson appears to be the third most popular, the former Prime Minister. Then the Defence Secretary, Ben Wallace, Kemi Badenoch could also be running, as well, perhaps, as the Foreign Secretary, James Cleverley, and maybe the just-resigned Home Secretary, Suella Braverman. Michael Gove, Tom Tugendhat and Jeremy Hunt are amongst those unlikely to take part after ruling themselves out of the race. Our Deputy Political Editor, Sam Coates, reports. Just 111 days ago, Boris Johnson came out of the door of number 10 and told the nation that he was stepping down. It was the end of a long struggle to stay in office, but for him... It was never over. A hint in his last speech to the Commons that he would be back. I want to thank everybody here and hasta la vista, <laughs> baby. Thank you. The former Prime Minister now looms over the race to be the next PM. This, a party in desperate need of a saviour. Some see the man who secured what is still a 71-seat majority as the only hope. What we need now, uh, we need someone who can come in, we need someone who can bring people together, somebody who actually has got that mandate, so a mandate from the people at the last general election, a mandate from party members, and somebody actually who can get this party going again, get us winning elections again. The only person that I think that ticks all those boxes is Boris Johnson. But the issues that nearly forced him out of office and nearly split his party in two still remain. The trust premiership too short to allow them to fully heal.
I was part of Team Boris. I was disappointed to see him go, but I, I, I think it's probably too soon. I think that's probably wishful thinking from some of my uh, colleagues on that front. Why do you say it's too soon? I, I, just, I just think it's too soon. The, 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 I was there supporting him to the very end, but he did lose the confidence of the majority of our colleagues. I thought that was wrong, but you have to respect that. This man believes he's the one to fix the crisis. You know, maybe setting up for the break. No answer to that question this morning. His supporters suggest it could come soon, however. MP's favourite last time round, but he made many enemies along the way. What you need to do is have a broad uh, group of people supporting you, a broad group of people coming into government, bringing the party together. And I think Rishi, with, who got support from right across the country, uh, got the most MP support last time, is the person to do that now, because we have to have that unity and also competence and economic leadership right at the top. Penny Morden faced down the opposition on Liz Truss's behalf earlier this week. For many, it looked like an audition for the top job. Her allies say she's the only one to unite a fractured party. Um, I think she has a great set of qualities. She has lots of ministerial experience. I think she comes across very well and I think she resonates with people. And right now, when we are facing a couple of international crises, both in energy but also in the Ukraine war, having somebody with stature, with government experience and who can resonate with people, I think is really important. Boris Johnson is doing what he always does, dominating the conversation, pushing everyone else to the margins. Now, today's Tory leadership rules look awfully like an attempt to stop him returning to high office, but he's smashed through obstacles before. And that's why some Tory MPs want to keep him away from the Tory membership where he remains a firm favourite. Plenty of others eyeing a run, but new Chancellor Jeremy Hunt says he's staying out. For the rest, a bruising few days ahead. It could be over sooner than next Friday if contenders drop out and deny the members a vote. But warnings this would damage the party further. If members of parliament rob the membership of their constitutional right by our rules to choose who is the leader of the party, uh, that will probably cause a lot of upset. It'll probably mean very few of us have any activists come the next general election and the party will fall into a, a, a very, very low place. He divided his party as Prime Minister. Some think he can now unite the party again. Will enough MPs try and stop Boris Johnson this time? Sam Coates, Sky News, Westminster. Well, our political editor, Beth Rigby, is here with me in Downing Street. And, mm. Beth, we keep saying this, don't we, about the extraordinary 24 mm. hours that has just mm. passed. But just address for us the process that finally got Liz Truss mm. to address reality. It all really started to unravel finally last night. It did. And, and I was on the television last night and I was saying it's clear that she's going to have to go. The question is the speed. And as these things sometimes go, the speed was fast this morning. You remember when Boris Johnson resigned, he went, when the herd moves, it moves, and it moved. It stampeded her this morning. Look, what happened overnight was that more letters or went in, more MPs publicly said that they couldn't back her. Then what happened was Sir Graham Brady, he's the guy that is the shop manager, if you like, of all of the Conservative MPs. He went in to see the Prime Minister. A source at the time said that the Prime Minister had asked to see him that she wanted to take the temperature of the party. He was soon followed in there by Therese Coffey, the Deputy Prime Minister, and Liz Truss's most trusted ally, and then Jake Berry, the chairman of the Conservative Party. And at that point, you're wondering, well, if Jake Berry's in there, is this now something about regime change? Uh, we then got very short notice about a statement at 1.30, ran down here, uh, and I was told by a source a few minutes before that she was going to resign. Uh, as my source said to me, it's over, it's over for her. And, and then she came out. 90 seconds, wasn't it, she spoke for? A very short statement. Let's move on then to, to the battle, the, the contest to replace her. Now, we were told during this kind of drawn out process that they may be looking to have a coronation to choose an agreed candidate clearly they haven't been able to do that and so we are going to get it's going to be foreshortened but we're going to get eight days of drift again we are 
potentially not going to have eight days of drift um, and the reason I say that is the way they have structured the contest is they've set the threshold for the number of MPs that you have to get to support you extremely high. I was told earlier in the week that they were looking at maybe 100 to 120 MPs. Some people didn't think that they would set the bar quite that high because they argued the parliamentary party wouldn't want to feel it was, to quote this senior conservative, a stitch up uh, for one individual individual candidate, but Sir Graham Brady, when he was explaining the rules, said to us earlier, he thought up to three people could potentially get the nominations. There's 357 MPs. To give you a bit of context of where we are, Rishi Sunak got 137 backers in the round, the first contest where Liz Truss went on to win. Penny Mordaunt got 105. So you could see a scenario where Rishi Sunak and Penny Mordaunt get through. That just about leaves enough for Boris Johnson. Boris Johnson uh, has a number of backers. There are doubts that he can get to that figure. Uh, of 100 uh, from MPs. And also Keir Starmer, when I interviewed earlier today, uh, had all the attack lines ready of MPs ousting him to then uh, bring him back into power. It, it could be quite a leap, couldn't it, for the party. But the reason I say it could be a coronation, and Dermot, I don't know, is that if only one candidate gets over the line by 2 p.m. on Monday, that person is effectively the Prime Minister. So, at the latest, we'll have a new Prime Minister by Friday, a week tomorrow. Uh, and at the earliest, we could have someone so just in post by Beth, Monday. They're not going to whittle them down. So, if one person gets over 100, I mean, that therefore means the more that stand, the more chance one person has of getting through. So not, they, 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 won't, they, they won't then say, we'll throw out the bottom two you, or whatever you, and move on? You sim no, you, sim you have to have over 100 nominations to go into it. If you have three, then yes, there'll be a runoff between the three of them. What's really interesting though, Dermot, and this is what MPs were saying me, telling me they wanted and what's different from last time, is that Sir Graham has said there will be an indicative vote. Now, why does that matter? Because MPs last time wanted Rishi Sunak. He was the first choice members went for Liz Truss. So in this scenario, what the party is now doing, the parliamentary party is saying, if we put this out to members, if there isn't one, only one candidate for an online ballot ahead of Friday, MPs want to single, signal to members who is their choice. And they hope, I guess, that that will influence members' votes. The question is, if, the question is, if there's two candidates and the preferred candidate of MPs doesn't win, what situation are we then? And I, I think the big picture in all of this, Dermot, as I said in that piece to camera, this party is so riven with grievances, with bitterness, with division. Whoever takes over, it's going to be one hell of a job to bring the Conservative Party back together. Let's leave that as, uh, as your final thought for the moment. See you again soon, Beth, because I want to uh, test the temperature within the party, within sections of the party, as Beth's referring to, because we'll speak now to John Lamont, uh, a Conservative MP supporting Penny Mordaunt. Uh, so, well, uh, very good to talk to you, Mr Lamont. Uh, do you think she will get 100 then to get into the, the final running? Well, so I know Penny is um, speaking to um, colleagues this evening and she's been overwhelmed by the number of colleagues, number of MPs who have spoken to her who have indicated they would like her um, to stand. And I, I certainly hope that she does stand. I backed her back in the summer when there was a leadership election after Boris had um, resigned and I and I hope she put, put, puts herself um, forward again. I'll certainly enthusiastically back her if, if that's what she decides to do. Is it a strength that she served loyally in Liz Truss's cabinet, uh, presumably signed off on the disastrous mini-budget? Well, I think it's important that we um, look forward and learn the lessons um, from the mistakes that have made over, over the last sort of month, month or so. I, mean, I, do, I believe Penny is the candidate that can bring not just the, the party together um, in terms of the cabinet and also the wider um, party of, of, of MPs, but she can bring the, the, the country together and reach into parts of the electorate, um, which I think we've perhaps not connected with in, in the best way that we might might have done. So I think Penny has great voter appeal. And if we're trying to get ourselves back, back in, in, into an improved position compared to where we are just now in the opinion polls. I think Penny is the person to do that. So she would unite the party and unite the country. But would she? I mean, can we be assured that she's rid herself of the idea that Liz Truss's original policies were a good idea? 
But I mean, those were policies of um, Liz Truss, and um, clearly she has acknowledged... And her cabinet. She made, she, she made mistakes, and the cabinet has acknowledged that mistakes have, have, have been made, and we now need to move forward. I, I believe Penny has, has the skills in terms of taking on Labour, taking on the SNP, and putting forward a fresh mandate, fresh ideas, and, cru and crucially, I think, bringing all talent in, into her cabinet. She's been very, very clear, I think, during the last contest, that she would run a very inclusive cabinet, bringing people in from all parts of the party and all talent. And that's, that, I think, is what the parliamentary party wants, and that's what the country expects. And in terms of the talent in the next cabinet, is it a given that the Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, has to remain the Chancellor? He's the man who has calmed the markets. He's the man who's working on this all-important statement on October the 31st, just three days, potentially, after the new Prime Minister is installed. He has to stay whoever wins, doesn't he? Well, clearly that's a matter for whoever whoever wins this contest and a matter for Penny if she became pr Prime Minister, if she decides to uh, stand. But I think you're right. Gen Jeremy Hunt has done an incredible job over, over the last few days, just settling things down, calming um, nerves, reassuring the city. Um, and hopefully the new government, new, the new Prime Minister, will be able to continue that. And certainly, um, as I say, I'm not going to... Um, second guess what the new pre 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 prime minister would do, but I don't. I don't dispute your assertion that Jeremy has done a very good good job in the last few days. But on that basis, given we're all watching the money markets, the bond markets, they almost have a vote in this. Wouldn't it be better to have, in effect, two chancellors in there? And I'm talking about Rishi Sunak, either as prime minister or perhaps as chancellor under Jeremy Hunt. If you want reassurance, and the bond markets certainly do, they would give it. Well, what I hope is whoever is, is Prime Minister, um, all those names will be in the Cabinet um, serving the, the Prime Minister and serving um, the country. I think one of the criticisms of Liz Truss's um, administration was there wasn't a broad enough church within her Cabinet. I would hope that whoever takes over, and I obviously hope that Penny will stand and Penny will be successful, she will bring all these people in to ensure that we are not just reassuring the city, but reassuring the wider electorate that we know what we're doing, we're able to run the economy and we're able to run the um, country. Because I think people have you know, been a bit unsettled, it's fair to say, over the last few um, weeks and months, and they want reassurance that we're moving forward. I think Penny has those skills to do that. John Lamont, very good talking to you. Thank you very much indeed for joining us on Sky News tonight. And you are watching Sky News tonight, a special live programme from Downing Street coming up. We'll be speaking to the former Education Secretary, Justine Greening. Crawford and I'm Sky's special correspondent based in Istanbul. This is going to be the biggest party Tripoli has ever seen. That's it, it, it got us then. There's a lot of action going on, a lot of heat still. We aim to be the best and the most trusted place in the news. at all, a lot of them extremely thin and very frail. Look at her arms, I can put my entire hand round. This is the cocktail of drugs which the doctors at this hospital have been giving their coronavirus patients. Made for people who want clarity in an uncertain world. Mother Nature is, can be vicious, absolutely savage. I can't imagine how much plastic is lying at the bottom of this huge lake. Oh! <laughs> Close and personal with your own. This is what makes the job so fun.
Welcome back to Downey Street, where Liz Truss resigned as Prime Minister this afternoon. The battle is now well underway to replace her. There will be a new Prime Minister in place by next Friday, the 28th. Uh, let's talk now then to the former Education Secretary and former Conservative MP, of course, Justine Greening. Uh, very good to see you, Justine Greening. Well, first of all, do you think Liz Truss did the right thing? I think it was inevitable. Uh, so, yes, I do. And I think the big mistake that she made was thinking that she could simply leave behind the mandate that the Conservative Party won at the last election, which was to drive a levelled up Britain. People wanted skills and talent and equality of opportunity, not tax cuts. And so she's fallen on her sword, uh, having sacked the Chancellor. So the architects of that process now gone. Who should replace her? I mean, I put the point earlier to a Penny Mordaunt supporter that perhaps anyone who was in that cabinet should not be really suitable for the job. I think the question is, is almost as much what that next prime minister is there to do as, as much as it is who. The reality mm. is people have been very clear what they wanted from this Conservative administration when they voted for it at the last election. This is a leadership contest to sort out who is going to be best placed to deliver that agenda of levelling up. And, and I think what the party needs to realise and remember is that levelling up is the growth strategy for Britain. There are businesses around this country who cannot get the skills that they need. That's what's hindering growth. And so really, this is going to be a contest about who can deliver that the best. What an incoming prime minister does not get to do is to totally reinvent their own mandate. And Liz Truss's big mistake alongside Kwasi Kwarteng was to shift away from levelling up and suddenly think that they could do whatever they wanted. That's not how the British democracy works. And if a, a new Conservative administration coming in fails to learn that lesson, then they will probably go down the same route that Liz Truss's administration has just done. And what the next Prime Minister has to do is realise that they simply can't invent any money. It's all gone. There's nothing left to spend. It's all about filling in black holes. Is there a case, you talk about levelling up, but uh, is there a case for saying the next administration will be, well, more like the one you served in, that uh, there has to be a dollop of austerity? Well, there are going to clearly be some difficult choices about how you balance the books, but what the markets want to see is a long-term economic plan for Britain. And the reality is it's lives that are off track that cost the taxpayer money, not lives that are on track and contributing and in work and paying tax. So levelling up isn't just about being a fairer society, it is the economic strategy for Britain. Increasing productivity, Derma, is about improving per capita GDP growth. It's about people. We now have to understand that in the same way we talk about long-term investment in physical infrastructure, whether it's roads, railways, we have to have a long-term investment in our human capital people so that they can be the growth driver, if you like, of the, the economy long term. And I think that's what the markets want to see. They want to see that long term plan. What I want to see from those people who are now seeking to replace this trust is how do they plan to drive level a leveled up brand? How are they going to put that long term plan in place to finally deliver equality of opportunity? Because that's what the British people were voting for. And actually, in terms of how you bring the Conservative parliamentary parties together, it's levelling up that is that common thread that I think all MPs in the Conservative Party can get behind. Justine Greening, great to get your thoughts as always. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you. Well, now discussing the markets, uh, there was positive market reaction in the moments after Liz Truss announced her resignation. It was her radical economic plan, as we've just been discussing, and the subsequent humiliating climb downs that sent those shockwaves through the economy. Our data and economics editor, Ed Conway, has been looking at that reaction at the Sky News Centre. Perhaps the best place to start, actually, is looking back all the way... Well,
Well, not really very far. 44 days, six weeks uh, of what's happened in the pound versus the dollar, because never really have we had a prime ministership which has been so defined by what's happened in markets for the entirety uh, of those, indeed, six weeks. And it's worth just running through it. This is the pound against the US dollar. There have been various other charts we've been looking at recently, in particular government bond rates. But this also tells you quite a lot, because the higher that is, the stronger the pound is, the lower it is. The weaker the pound is, you can see the moment that Liz Truss came in. And just look at this line as it continues through September. You had, obviously, the mini budget, now notorious. And look at what happened to sterling after that. Weakening, 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 getting down to the lowest level that it's ever, ever got to against the US dollar, only a few weeks ago now, and then gradually recovering as the Bank of England intervened. And, of course, later on, Kwasi Kwarteng uh, getting fired. And you can see the pound getting stronger there. And, indeed, all the way up to where we are now, with Liz Truss resigning, the pound strengthened again. Not by all that much, frankly, compared with the enormous roller coaster that we've had since. But what this underlines is the extent to which, first, this has been defined by charts like this, and secondly, any future leadership contest is likely to be defined as well by what happens in markets, because we're in an extraordinary moment now with a new chancellor who can expect, potentially, that he might be able to hold on to that place, if only because people are so nervous about what's happening in financial markets. We've never seen a prime ministership quite like this one, both in terms of the policy, in terms of the length, and in terms of the concentration of what financial markets think about the UK. Ed Conway there with the analysis, and you're watching Sky News tonight. Coming up, we'll get some of the international reaction to today's resignation with a former US ambassador to the United Kingdom. Anticipation is rising, and so is the atmosphere. Are you ready? The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways.
Welcome back to Downing Street. Let's look now at some of the international reaction to the Prime Minister's resignation, namely out of the United States. And this was President Joe Biden speaking as he left the White House a bit earlier. She was a good partner on Russia and Ukraine, and, uh, and the British are going to solve their problems. And the, but she was a good partner. President, but reference to the UK's problems. Well, let's speak now to Matthew Barzun, the former United States ambassador to the United Kingdom, of course, knows this country very well. And, and could I just get you to reflect, and very good to talk to you, Ambassador, just to reflect on in the, what, the five years or so since you left, four prime ministers, do you recognise this country anymore? <laughs> uh, good to be with you again. Thanks for having me on. No, I, I do recognise it, of course. Um, there have been four prime ministers leaving in that amount of time. There's been one political party in power that whole time. So there's been change within a party that's remained the same. Um, the thing I've been focusing on and answering questions from Americans who like me are big admirers of your country is that so often if we're talking about British political traditions, we as Americans find ourselves saying, look, it's strange to us, but it's old and it, uh, and it works for them. And I think in the case of what we're seeing here, and this is not about the who, by the way, I know there's good discussion about who might be next and what they might focus on. What I think is fascinating and important on both sides of the Atlantic is the how, how she was selected. And this is a case where how prime ministers are selected um, seems strange to my British friends. It is not old, it is brand new, 1998, and it is, I think, demonstrably not working. And they're going to go through the whole process again. So let's talk about then those, those qualities, as you say, recognised in the United States, were recognised the world over for the United Kingdom. Stability and continuity. Have they both been trashed? And if they have been, is that temporary or can it return pretty quickly? Well, I, I, I think uh, Her Majesty the Queen and, and her life and her example and the outflowing of support following her passing is actually something to focus on and I think could teach us a lesson on both sides of the Atlantic at this time. A word that, that came up in almost every tribute I read and I heard about her life and her 70 year reign was the word steadfast and appropriately. And what I think is interesting, if you look at how she led, she was steadfast and she was always open to change. Because if you aren't open to change, then you become fixated and it doesn't take too long before you look out of touch. And if you do the other extreme, if you get too far out in front, then you seem uh, you know, out of touch in the other direction. So the key is to always be changing with public um, opinion. And I think that's something she did. And I think politicians on both sides of the Atlantic ought to learn from. And, and just finally, Ambassador, just uh, let's talk about hard cash there. The, the mighty American corporate machine, when it's looking to invest, I, I, I know you know uh, many of the, of the leaders of businesses in the United States, when they're looking to invest in Europe, are they now beginning to put a question mark against the United Kingdom because they're going to wait for stability to return? I, I don't think so. I think, look, I think that the, the, you went through Brexit or going through Brexit, that was... Um, something to get adjusted to for, for those of us on this side of the pond. I think, look, we've gone through our own democratic upheavals. I don't know what other diplomatic words to use. Um, I'm sure British admirers of America have learned more about the electoral college recently and all sorts of things we've been going through. And I think what provides the stability in the transatlantic relationship isn't who's in 1600 Pennsylvania or who's in number 10 Downing Street. I mean, those are important. Sometimes it's a deep, deep, strong partnership. It's always a good friendship, whether we agree or disagree. But the real strength and the real ballast in the ship, so to speak, actually comes from the millions of relationships um, across that ocean between regular citizens, between, you know, we watch each other's television, we read each other's books, we watch each other's sport, all of that. Um, military leadership, intelligence cooperation, the special relationship, I think, lives in and through each and every one of those sinews of peace, to uh, paraphrase uh, Winston Churchill. 
Ambassador Matthew Barson, very good talking to you again. Thank you very much indeed for joining us on Sky News once again. Former Thanks to US Ambassador to the United Kingdom. Well, it was just after half past one this afternoon that Liz Truss stood on the steps of Downing Street behind me, the same steps where just 44 days earlier she pledged to deliver, deliver, deliver. This time, though, she announced her resignation, and uh, this is what she said. I came into office at a time of great economic and international instability. Families and businesses were worried about how to pay their bills. Putin's illegal war in Ukraine threatens the security of our whole continent. And our country has been held back for too long by low economic growth. I was elected by the Conservative Party with a mandate to change this. We delivered on energy bills and on cutting national insurance. And we set out a vision for a low tax, high growth economy that would take advantage of the freedoms of Brexit. I recognise, though, given the situation, I cannot deliver the mandate on which I was elected by the Conservative Party. I have therefore spoken to His Majesty the King to notify him that I am resigning as leader of the Conservative Party. This morning I met the chairman of the 1922 committee, Sir Graham Brady. We've agreed that there will be a leadership election to be completed within the next week. This will ensure that we remain on a path to deliver our fiscal plans and maintain our country's economic stability and national security. I will remain as Prime Minister until a successor has been chosen. Thank you. The 92nd resignation speech of Liz Truss there. Well, I'm joined now by Alistair Burt, a former Conservative MP and former Foreign Minister, and Sarah Southern, David Cameron's former senior aide, now turned Tory comedian. Very good to talk to you both. Well, uh, let's talk about, first of all, uh, Liz Truss's decision to go. Only 44 days in power. But uh, Sarah Southern, was that too long? Should she have gone with her original Chancellor? Probably yes, but perhaps she should never have been selected in the first place. I was always quite surprised that she got to the final two when it was the leadership contest earlier in the summer. I felt that probably the party membership would vote for her, so it was a shame that the MPs felt that she was the right person to go up against Rishi Sunak. But I think if you're going to lose a Chancellor and a Home Secretary in very short succession, you haven't really got a choice but to walk out of that door at number 10 as well. OK, Alistair, but your thoughts on that, the damage that has been wreaked, and we care, we all care most about the country, of course, but also to your party. Uh, I, obviously, the, the concern with the country will be put right because uh, there'll be a reset. There has to be a reset of the economy. Many challenges are still out there. Chancellor Jeremy Hunt has already started on that process. But the long-term damage is quite considerable. I mean, the, the fact that we are seen as a stable country, a very stable democracy, we've been through all this, we will get through it. It won't uh, cause terminal damage to the United Kingdom. But the damage to reputation is significant. Damage to potential investment is high. So there's going to be a, a, an, an important challenge for the new prime minister to put that right as soon as possible and hope in the process that some of the reputation of the party, which has been shredded in recent months, uh, gets a chance to be restored, along with the reputation of the country. And that naturally leads us into who should that be? Sarah Southern, what are your thoughts? And, and should there really be another contest after that long, drawn-out summer? Here we go. Another week, and it seems at the moment that Uncle Tom Cobley and all are standing. Well, I'm really pleased that they've put the threshold of 100 MPs, because then that at least is a big chunk of support of the MPs, and it's going to make sure that the list is very small. I would hope that the MPs kind of unite behind one candidate, and we basically have a new Prime Minister on Monday. That would be my preference. I'm personally not that too bothered whether the membership is asked as to who should uh, be the new prime minister. I think what we need to do now is have a strong prime minister that is totally supported by the members of parliament. What was apparent at party conference a mere, what, three and a half weeks ago up in Birmingham is there was no party discipline. The MPs did not support the prime minister. You had ministers who would, you know, literally be 
openly criticising the Prime Minister, which you would never have seen in the past. You would never have seen MPs, you know, be, being that um, uh, unloyal, disloyal rather, to the, to the Prime Minister or to the party leader. I want to see the Conservative Party rebuild so they can actually deliver to the country, as that's what they haven't been doing. Well, I'm sure Alistair Bird agrees, but can that actually happen? I mean, Sarah Southern there men mentioning the, the conference and the shambles that that was. And then we had last night's vote where there's pushing, shoving. I mean, I mean it's the political version of a, of a bar brawl taking place here. Do you think they can sort it out? I hope so, but I'm not sure. There are some really deep rifts in the Conservative Party. Um, I'm absolutely with, with Sarah. We all hope that colleagues would see that their only possibility of recovering any credibility with the British public is to unite and present uh, a, a competent front to the British people as they get on with the job. But I don't underestimate how deep the divisions are. Uh, they are there between those who wanted to follow a particular ideological economic path, who will be quite angry that it's not come to pass. There'll be those who felt excluded uh, by uh, mistrust and indeed by Boris Johnson. Um, because of their views in relation to the EU, and will they be able to come back and be uh, part of the team going forward? Those concerns are still there. Uh, there's uh, splits sometimes between those in different parts of the country and what their needs are. There's some big challenges there. So I don't think we should... I, I, I think the Conservative Party has got to address these honestly, not simply assume that these differences will go away. Because unless they do, unless they are prepared to recognise that we have moved on from some of the problems in the past, I think some of the sharp differences will be there. And Suella Braverman's um, so-called resignation yesterday uh, seemed to point the finger uh, to where some of those debates would go. And that's what we don't want to see, because that sort of sharp contest will really focus on the divisions in the party, which is not okay. probably what the country wants to see either. And just the last thought about this search for a, a big figure, a uniting figure, a reassuring figure. Well, Sarah Southern, they've already actually got one, haven't they? Who, uh, the resident of the, the door that I'm standing 20 metres away for, number 11, the Chancellor. And whoever becomes Prime Minister has got a pretty big character to work alongside. Absolutely. Look, I think Jeremy Hunt probably won't throw his hat into to the, the ring. I think he is being a good Chancellor so far. Um, I think Penny Morden would be an excellent choice. I would also support Ben Wallace. Uh, but whoever we pick, let's unite. Let's just get on with the job. Uh, we haven't got long until there's a next general election. So let's put the front, front, front foot forward and support whoever next goes into number 10. OK, great talking to you both. Thank you very much indeed, Sarah Southern and Alistair Burt. And you're watching Sky News tonight. Coming up, I'm going to be speaking to the SNP's Westminster leader. He is, of course, Ian Blackford. I'm Becky Johnson, a Sky News Midlands correspondent based here in Birmingham. Allegations of exploitation in Leicester's clothing factories aren't new. In fact, it's been an open secret in this city for years. 
made for people who want clarity in an uncertain world. We're getting more and more stabbings and essentially I think it's more and more younger children. Here in the diverse industrial heart of England, we hear from people who have real stories to tell. Parents are going to complain like this. These protests are being organised primarily by people who aren't parents at the school. We have to be prepared that patients will die from, from this illness. The River Severn is still rising and people here in Ironbridge have been told it could go up by another metre. We aim to be the best and most trusted place for news. Welcome back to Downing Street. Now, the First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon, has also been reacting to the Prime Minister's resignation. This is what she said. In terms of my interactions with Liz Truss, you know, it is quite absurd, I guess, that she has come into office and left office and there hasn't even been a phone call to me or to the First Minister of Wales. But actually, in the, you know, the, the realms of political history, Liz Truss is going to be a footnote and... You know, we need to now firstly see stability for the UK um, and that means undoubtedly a general election to try to restore some kind of stability. Let's talk now then to the leader of the SNP in Westminster, Ian Blackford. Very good to talk to you, Mr Blackford. And just on that, um, from the First Minister there, there's clearly no love lost between them. Well, no, indeed. Um... And, of course, you had the First Minister saying there that she'd never met uh, Liz Trust, neither did myself as leader of the third party in Westminster. Look, I mean, Liz Trust is gone, and I'm, I'm relieved that we've had the announcement today, but let's just reflect on the legacy that she leaves behind, because that fallout from the mini-budget, the damaging impact that it had on the financial markets, the intervention of the Bank of England, the increase in mortgage rates, that, that legacy is that many people are facing higher mortgage costs as a as a consequence, and we've also, although we've got the energy price cap in place for a few months, and I welcome that, we've still got the issue of what happens next spring when that cap comes off. So there are specific challenges that we face. Herbert, we all witnessed the scenes yesterday in the House of Commons, the chaos that's gone on. I, I think it is the case that this is a Conservative government that's out of time. It's lost its way, and it is right that we have that election, that it's not just Tory MPs and Tory members that are casting a vote on who is to be our next Prime Minister, not elected on the votes of the people, but that we have that general election and we have the opportunity for the public to have their say and we're able to point that course as, as to our way forward. And of course, for us in Scotland, okay. we want that opportunity to be able to express our desire to have that uh, referendum in Scotland's future. OK, well, we've heard that call. We heard it from Nicola Sturgeon, of course. We've uh, heard it from Sir Keir Starmer, Sir Ed Davey. We're hearing it from all the members of the opposition. But given the system, how do you get one and given the size of the Conservative majority? Well, that is the issue. And I, I would appeal to Conservative MPs to recognise the public mood. That the public are clamouring for an election. The support for the Conservative Party has fallen through the floor. We could limp on with the... Conservative government right through to 2024. But I would ask the question, is that really in the interests of all the nations of the United Kingdom? I think at some point they've got to put the national interests to the front and not just their narrow party interests. What you see is a Tory party that's split. You're seeing that already emerging in the debate as to who should become the leader. In many respects, some of the differences, some of the difficulties are really to do with the post-Brexit period. With a Brexit that has done enormous damage to the UK, to our trading capability, to, to jobs, to investment. And perhaps that's often the important aspects we should be discussing about when we're considering delivering sustainable economic growth, because many of the paths to delivering that sustainable economic growth have been constrained by Brexit. And do you have any views on who should become the next Prime Minister, or do you just think that's up to the Conservative Party? They're going to do what they're going to do. We want a general election. Well, they are going to do what they want to do, but, but of course, we can explore our differences. Um, I would say to whoever is in government that they've got to respect the right of Scotland to have that independence referendum. But I'll extend the, the hand of friendship, if I may, to say that, of course, we will work constructively where we can. And I know that will be true for the First Ministers of the devolved nations as well. There are times we have to work together. 
Uh, of course, we face many challenges, not least the Ukraine war. There are times where we do pull together because it's right that all of us collectively stand with the people of Ukraine. We stand up against President Putin. And we had a demonstration of that in the House of Commons today with the statement from Ben Wallace. So I think there are times that we can work together, Dermot, but let's not underestimate the, the challenges and the scale of differences that we have. And I think the anger that we have, that the costs that there, there are for many people from the impact of Tory policies. And let's not forget, whilst the Chancellor has deemed the Tory government to some extent that they've plugged the gap by removing the tax cuts, there's that sword that hangs over us called public spending cuts that would do enormous damage to individuals, to families, to communities. And we can't have a story austerity 2.0. So there's going to be some big challenges and, okay. and big on the course of the coming period. And just lastly, uh, a quick thought, Mr Blackford, on the, the prospect of Boris Johnson standing and perhaps getting back in here. Good grief. Heavens, no, I think would be my response. Uh, you know, the, the, Boris Johnson was shown the door, and for very good reasons. Um, the behaviour that we saw when he was in office, he simply wasn't fit for office. I think the public would really question what the Conservative Party are up to if there's any consideration of bringing Boris Johnson back again. That simply cannot be allowed to happen for the sake of all of us.